Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jan Sixtens, and I'm the uh, chairman of the board of Rick Graduate School of Law. Uh, and I'm very pleased to see so many of you here in, in presence, and uh, I also hope that uh, there are plenty of people uh, uh, watching us online. Um, uh, this event uh, launches RGSL's Research Week, and uh, I think there is uh, some kind of a symbolism that this Research Week is traditionally held uh, in the autumn when we uh, reap fruits, and uh, uh, among other uh, fruits, we also uh, reap the fruits of our research that we have done um, over the last uh, year or so. Um, uh, today, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, our new rector, uh, Dr. Adam Chernata, uh, who has uh, kindly agreed to um, uh, present his views on uh, democratic frustration, uh, populism, and challenges to liberal uh, democratic constitutionalism in uh, Central uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, Dr. Cernota uh, has uh, been uh, a professor uh, at the Faculty of Law and Justice uh, at the uh, University of New South Wales in Australia, and he has also um, served as professor of law and director of Center of Legal Education and Social Theory at the uh, University of uh, Wroclaw. Uh, his research uh, interests include law and social theory, legal theory, legal history, and uh, comparative law. Uh, with this brief introduction, I would like to pass the microphone uh, to uh, Dr. Cernata. The floor is yours. I should not keep this. I do, I do have oh. one here, okay? Thank you for uh, <coughs> introduction. It is a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm very glad that this room is not overcrowded, which means that uh, academic freedom and is still dominant in this law school. It means that students are not forced to attend some, some lectures. <coughs> and uh, thank you for coming here. I am not sure if I have something new to you to say, but I will try at least. I got a tendency, actually, to speak faster and faster with each minute, so therefore, it would be nice, uh, I, I would like to ask you that if I will speak, start to speak very, very fast, then let me know to slow down and, uh, and <coughs> explain maybe in details what I want to say. So thanks for, uh, a lot for, the, for the having me here. I really am mm, great, grateful to organizers of this of that, uh, research week. And uh, it's an honor actually to, to deliver, to share with you some thoughts. So I choose as a topic here, uh, topic of my this introductory lecture, uh, some uh, outcome of a research which I had conducted for the some time with, together with uh, two of my collaborators and friends at the same time, Martin Krieger of the uh, University of New South Wales and uh, Wojciech Sadurski of the University of Sydney. And I have to add that this research were sponsored by the uh, Australian Research Council. And what uh, this outcome of the research actually has been published this year by Cambridge University Press under the title, uh, the title of this book is Anti-Constitutional Populism. Uh, I will try to limit my talk to the 45 minutes. Uh, and as already was said by Yanis, the title of my talk is Democratic Frustration, Populist and Challenge to Liberal Constitutionalists in Central Eastern Europe. And I want to warn you that this is the Riga Graduate School of Law, but my approach, my attitude actually in my research is not a doctrinal at all. So what I, what I do is actually not to play with a legal concept as such, but rather try to represent, or my attitudes to research is a, um, fits to the paradigm of a so-called socio-legal studies, which allow me to combine in my research uh, the first of all, legal issues with uh, social movements as such. So why such topic? Well, probably it would be more maybe ob obvious when I will start to talk about uh, <coughs> uh, populism. 
but the populism is, is growing, right? In the last uh, couple of years, then we see the explosion of populism everywhere in the world. It's not only in relation to Poland and Hungary, which are going to be my main point of reference here in the Central Eastern Europe, but you could find out also that these uh, populist movements uh, in the United States, in France, in Italy, right, and, uh, <coughs> and also in Latin America, well, let's say in Brazil, Bolsonaro regime at the moment in, in there. So that's why I choose the topic, because it seems to me is a quite important to, to, sort of the, to show you, to share with you my insight, my perception of the situation now. <coughs> and then how I'm going to, to, to proceed. I, will st I divided my talk to the six basically parts. In the first part, I will introduce the problem. In the second, I will try to present understandings of constitutionalisms. Then the, second, the third one, constitutionalists' attitudes towards populism. The fourth, populist and constitutionalists in Central Eastern Europe. The fifth, liberal constitutionalists as a source of populism. And uh, in the last part, I will I try to sort of the <coughs> wrap everything, is uh, I will ask, try to give answer to the question, is there populist constitutionalism? Can we talk about something like populist constitutionalism? So that's a structure of my, my, my talk. And now let's go to the, to the real issue. Well, <coughs> let's start maybe with such, 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 such following thesis. So what I want to defend, actually, in my lecture is uh, such thesis. What is happening in Poland and some other Central and Eastern European countries, former communist countries, is not a constitutional breakdown or backsliding, as uh, the expression coined by some, people, some researchers, but rather constitutional tectonic movements that, in my opinion, reflect the development of some new elements in constitutionalists in the region. In other words, I will try to show some alternative ways of interpreting the present situation in some countries in Central Eastern Europe with special reference to, to Poland. Another aim of this presentation or talk is to explore the relationship between populism and constitutionalism and particularly the impact of populism in power on constitutionalists in Central Eastern Europe. I have to make a dis this distinction that I use this, <laughs> I am focused on the populists in power, not populists who are as a movement or rhetoric, right? It means not, a disc not only this populist discourse, but rather what the populists do when they get power. And <coughs> In order to explain the phenomenon of populism and its relationship to constitutionalists, it is necessary, it seems to me, to go outside uh, one discipline and try to create new concepts which capture the phenomenon in its complexity. It is a first step in the right direction, it seems to me. Nevertheless, the properly understood contemporary populism and constitutionalism concepts need to be developed which fuse together legal, sociological, and historical dimensions of the phenomena in question. These tectonic movements, which I mentioned before, are part of the global changes visible in the, in the different parts of the, of the world. Nevertheless, the populace here in Central Eastern Europe had a different, not only form, but it seems to me the most important, the sources of the populism here in Central Eastern Europe are, are different. So let me formulate maybe such broad, again, the third hypothesis, that after 33 years since the victory of liberalism over communists on a global scale, the sources of stability of the liberal democratic world have been undermined by global processes. The most important of this, from my point of view, is the growing gap between liberal political elites in nation states and the masses of citizens. The political elites have become alienated by their connection with transnational economical interests and transnational institutions. The masses of citizens have withdrawn their support for the, alienate, for, for the alienated political elites 
And the outcome is the current constitutional struggle in many countries. Observing these processes, it seems that each country tries to adopt a different strategy to cope with the crisis. But what underlines all of these uh, strategies is a return to the nation state as a first point, then this, that and its role in the steering social processes and demand for the reshaping of the institutional system to make political elites accountable. In effect, there are growing anti-systemic movements and problems with the stability of constitutional systems. The social contract between political elites and citizens, that political elites rule, but the majority of society benefits from economical prosperity, belongs to the past. The landscape and form, forms of conflict in developed societies have radically changed. It is no surprise that constitutional institutions which regulated conflict during the time of the social contract are under great pressure. At the moment, no one dominant strategy of dealing with the problem is visible. Rather, what is visible is chaos on the institutional and policy level. Generally, the mainstream literature, and especially a mainstream discourse in Central Eastern Europe, European countries, the meaning of constitutionalism is reduced to only one, to liberal constitutionalism, which for almost 40 years has been the dominant paradigm in constitutional theory and constitutional practice. This is not surprising. Since the Second World War, countries in Western Europe and in North America dominated the democratic world, and the first and the second waves of democratization embark upon more or less successful attempts to install liberal <coughs> constitutional orders. It means after 1989, 1990, in this, in this part of the world, there was a no experiment, just simply repeat or adopt something which already worked. And it's in such a way that was an institutional design after 89, it was simply based on the copying of institution from outside. This is being described by the two distinguished political scientists, Ivan Krastev of Bulgaria and Stephen Holmes from US. Right? It means they describe the process of copying, institutional copying, and the copying of the ideas, basically you know, <coughs> cut and paste almost. And uh, how the commun former communist parties, uh, countries uh, borrow and develop this, uh, this liberal constitutionalism here on this, in this place. So what I wanted to say in this introduction is that, th that what's happened in the Central Eastern Europe in, since the beginning of the 90s is a ati special attitudes towards the constitutionalism. That only one version of constitutionalism, which was legitimate actually, was a liberal democratic type of constitutionalism. So let's go now, is this right or wrong? So what are the understanding actually of constitutionalism? By contrast to the, fo to the former thesis that is this understanding that only one type of constitutionalism is a liberal democratic constitutionalism, I, in my own view is that constitutionalism can be understood on at least three different levels. First level, as a legal principle of the internal superiority of the constitution, that constitutional law is the highest law in the legal system. The most important element of such an, such an understanding of constitutionalism is the conviction that a constitution is not only a political, but a legal document. The source of individual rights, but also duties. Such an understanding of constitutionalism is in sociological literature called legal constitutionalism. The second understanding of constitutionalism is a cis constitutionalism as ideology and stress the function of a constitution as a normative and institutional safeguard against arbitrary use of power, a means of guarding against tyranny. This understanding goes further than the legal understanding 
and, and mainly focus on the legal institutional organization of power in the state. Constitutional, insti constitutional institutions provide legal limits on the use of power. Quite often such understanding of constitutionalism is almost equal to the concept of the rule of law, right? But this, to make a picture not so clear but more complicated, the second understanding of constitutionalism is, exists basically in the three different versions as such. The first is a liberal one. It means liberal, what is the specificity of this liberal ideological perception of constitutionalism is a stress on the, on the guarantees of individual rights. It means domination of individual rights. Then the second one is an is a understanding, republican version of that uh, <coughs> understanding of constitutionalism as, uh, as ideology. Republican version focuses on the community of citizens and lays more stress on citizens' duties rather than, uh, so, uh, than on, on rights. And the third one, the third version of, of a constitutionalist as ideology, is a popular constitutionalism, which seeks to maintain, maintain the participation of citizens in political decision-making process. In this third type, institutions of direct democracy are more prominent than in the other two. Each of these subtypes has different emphasis and stress different complexes of institutional design. And finally, and it, is, it play quite important role it seems to me, is a third understanding of constitutionalism. Remember the first one was, was a, as a legal principle, it means this legal constitutionalism. The second constitutionalism as an ideology. And the last one is a political and legal theorist also understand constitutionalists as a focus of systemic, empirical, and theoretical investigations. Particular foci of such investigations are the functions of constitutions, the best institutional ways to achieve them, and their historical, social, and cultural context. In other words, this understanding of constitutionalists is a reflection upon political institutional practices in particular countries. So that's uh, after this introduction that, uh, that we could understand constitutionalism on plenty of different layers, right? Then let me make a next step. It means to present how the constitutionalists actually nowadays, what is their approach to populism? It means how they try to cope or address the issue put forward by, by populists. And it seems to me that the, we could distinguish three different phases of, the, of this attitude towards the populism. The first phase was ignore them. It means ignore almost like a counseling. It means not mention, but simply ignore. Then the second is a critique. But the critique, from what point of view? And uh, Wojciech Sadurski, in his book, Poland's constitutional breakdown probably describe the most, in most sophisticated way the critique from the liberal constitution, liberal democratic point of view. And he is honest, honest in such way that he's not hiding in this, in this critique of populism his normative assumptions that the individual rights, freedom is uh, the most important for him. Now the <coughs> The last book, actually, which I want to mention, is not a promotion, is, a, is a Wojtek's, Wojtek's books, is a Epidemics of Populism, which was, is just fresh, you know, came from the, from, from the press and published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, additionally to this critique, I could mention plenty of different articles written by Gabor Halmai, who used to be a professor of constitutional, comparative constitutional law at EUI, European University Institute, or let's say that uh, uh, articles written by, by Kim Scheple, the professor of, the, of, uh, of sociology from, from Princeton. And last but not least, uh, I want to mention, let's say, the book written by Timia 
Tri noci and Agnieszka Bień Kacała on the illiberal, illiberal democracy in Poland and, and Hungary. So that's the critical attitude. It means all of them share something, it seems to me. What is, is sharing is this attitude to a critique of populism, but from, the <coughs> from this liberal point of view only, and the claiming that what is happening in Poland and Hungary is backsliding, right? But you know, if, if there is a backsliding, then we have to achieve some point to go back, right? To slide back. And I am not sure, I am not convinced that this point actually of a robust, developed, liberal, <coughs> democratic constitutionalism is being achieved in countries in question. So recently, the third wave actually of the attitudes of constitutionalists towards uh, populism is much more sophisticated, it seems to me. It's not only reduced to the, to the critique from such, some points of view only, but it's based rather focus on the causes and effects of populists in power. And they try to see empowering potential, at least in some populist movement. Such approach, it seems to me, is being represent, represented of such approach is Paul Blocker, the sociologist now from University of Bologna, <coughs> and uh, Bojan Bugaric, the Slovenian co uh, lawyer now working in Sheffield in UK, or Mark Tashnet, because they published this book, they wrote this book together. It means Bogaric with, with Mark, Ta Mar Mark Tashnet. So that that's <coughs> they understand populism as a very complex phenomenon and not at all uniform, and consider that in the Central Eastern Europe, it is a reaction to former practices of institutional and social change implemented from, from above. So after the presentation of these different types of uh, meaning of constitutionalism and uh, attitudes by, by constitutionalists towards populism, now I want to move to the, so the description of a uh, populism and uh, relation between the populist and constitutionalists in Central Eastern Europe. Well, what is populist? Because I use this expression populist, populist, and uh, what is it actually? And a populist is not a new phenomenon. What is new in the last global wave of populists in power is a more serious attitude to law and constitutional institutions. So if I want to make some comparison, so if you compare the populists as a Peronism or the populists in the 50s or 60s, they simply disregard the institutions. The present wave of populism, they treat institutions and law seriously, which does not mean that they don't treat this legal institution in the instrumental way. They do. But nevertheless, they don't want to immediately abolish them, right? They want to use them from the point of view of the introduction, present of introduction of their own, own policies. Populists in Central Eastern Europe, Europe, Europe criticize liberal constitutional, constitutional democracy as they do not hide the fact that their aim is to change the constitutional regime. They also heavily criticize legalism and its stress on procedure and procedural justice. In countries where they have won a constitutional majority, populists change the constitution, like in Hungary, right? Uh, <coughs> the example commonly discussed today is precisely this Hungarian case. In countries where they did not win a constitutional majority, operation of co constitutional institution have been changed through normal statutes or reinterpretation of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of norms and institutions. And in effect, some people claim that is a sort of the <coughs> abuse of the constitution by the populists in power in Central Eastern Europe. It is worth considering the idea that contemporary populism, which does not neglect but uses constitutional law and institution, is an outcome of weak political constitutionalism, which allows the populist forces perhaps not to hijack the constitutions, but to use them for populist advantage in a rather instrumental way. 
That in itself might provide evidence that legal liberal constitutionalism, which for more than three decades has dominated in theory and practice, is not in danger, but is simply very weak and not able to defend itself. Legally entrenched liberal constitutionalists implemented in C uh, Central Eastern Europe after 1989 does not itself provide enough barriers for populist forces and social and political institutions. <coughs> social and political institutions are needed actually that, not, uh, may, maybe differently, that constitution itself should be rooted, embodied in the social structure, which is not, not, not new thesis, but that what is here, that this, this liberal democratic constitutionalist is weak precisely because these institutions were not embodied in the society, in social structure. So <coughs> as, as I mentioned before, Populism is a complex phenomenon and easily escapes attempts at theoretical conceptualization and generalization. At present, analyst, the, mm, at present analysts of, the, of po po populism need more empirical studies. Probably the best book I could recommend you on populism is a, is a book written by Nadia Urpina Urbinati, Italian and, uh, and also professor, Italian scholar, but also professor at Columbia. And uh, she wrote this uh, very good book called I, the People, right, in which she analyzed the contemporary, contemporary populism. And uh, <coughs> so, as, as I said, that uh, more empirical studies are needed. We have not achieved such stage of accumulation of knowledge which will allow us to make theoretical claims with universal validity. The reform I remarks below will be more empirically oriented, especially based on the experience in, in Poland and in Hungary. By constitutionalism as a working type of the, let's say, uh, <coughs> definition, I mean norms and institutions which structure and manage conflict in societies and allow expression of cultural identity. This is more of a sociological than a legal understanding of constitutionalism. The norms and institutions managing conflicts in particular states were and are different. I suggest that the most important part of norms and institutions managing conflict in nation state is constitutional tradition, which is an emanation of the identity of particular societies. It determined the shape of their institutional and uh, substan substance of norm. Constitutionalism, so understood, needs a particular cognitive perspective, namely a long-term one, not a short one, a short-term one. Here I invoke the long durée, a perspective adopted by sociologically oriented historians and historical sociologists, but not lawyers and especially not legal theoreticians or constitutional lawyers. The last two groups focus on of constitution and their role in society from a short term perspective. So we have to take into account the long durée perception of a constitutionalist as institutions and norms structuring and managing conflict and expressing identity in particular societies. In short, there is a, no space actually here to go to the Middle Ages, but, I, but we, we could go, let's say, and show precisely how this constitutionalist evolved all the cultural traditions since something like, let's say, 10, 11, or 12th 12, 12 century. Liberal constitutionalism is relatively new, established in Central, Euro Central Eastern Europe after World War II, and in case of the CEU, uh, sorry, in Central Europe after First World, First World II, and in uh, Central Eastern Europe much later, it means in the 90s. The liberal constitutionalism established in the former communist countries was based on the purely ideological approach of uh, intelligentsia, a special group peculiar to this part of the world, and uh, 
intelligentsia in the broadest sense as a group of people with, uh, who possess some knowledge and degrees with, uh, in, in higher education institutions, and the, uh, the group which is self-conscious of, uh, of its social and political mission. It not, it's not the same as the concept of the middle class, understood as a social group sharing a similar income and a style of life. After 1989, the intelligentsia embarked on the road of the institutional modernization of these former communist states. And as the only group which has some theoretical knowledge of the institutional system in the so-called West, it happily engaged itself in the rather unreflective borrowing and transplantation of legal and constitutional institution, ignoring the social background necessary for the operation of such institution. The Western version of liberal constitutionalism was part of this modernization project. The engagement of intelligentsia in the modernization project based on an unreflective copying of Western institution has not been purely platonic, but functionally it served the interests of precisely this social group. The intelligentsia was the real winner of the political economic transformation after 1989. Member of this group at least received liberation from political restriction and in comparison to other groups in societies at the end of the communist area, the intelligentsia were not an economic loser from the transformation, precisely because of the position and the type of the implemented uh, modernization project. Liberal democratic constitutionalism in Central Eastern European countries was the reform imposed by a, rather by a rather narrow group of elites and was not adopted with the mass involvement of people. After the political changes in 1989, there was no constitutional moment according to the criteria established by or expressed by Bruce Ackerman. <coughs> Similar opinion regarding new constitution in post-communist Central Eastern European countries are evident in the uh, writing of Andras Shayo, the <coughs> constitutional law professor uh, in uh, Central uh, Central European, yeah. what is it called? Europe, uh, CEU, right? C CEU, precisely. It should be stressed, and this is usually overlooked, that the Polish 1997 constitution did not and does not enjoy much significant recognition. And the reform does not have strong popular legitimacy, since it's, it, it gained so little support in the referendum to accept it. The turnout in the referendum of the Polish constitution among those with the right to vote was just 42.86%. 53.45% voted for the adoption of the constitution and 46.5% against. If we couple this with the constitutional commission rejection of the citizens initiative there was a citizens project of the constitution which was turned down by the constitutional commission of a of a national assembly <coughs> mm. this picture this fuller picture tells us that legal constitutionalism in poland was an expression of a vision of a political community of a very limited part of polish society and did not enjoy the support of majority of citizens. Some scholars, as Martin Krieger for instance, stress the necessity <coughs> of institutionalization of the rule of law. But institutionalization of the rule of law is, is in no relation to the imposition of some legal institutions almost from above. So that's, the, it seems to me, the first uh, cause right, of the rise of populism in in some Central Eastern European countries. The second cause is the political maturity of society. It means in 1989, there were not many people with practical knowledge of the mechanism of the functioning of the free market, democracy, constitutionalism, and the rule of law. 
This paved the way for unreflective copying and imitation of the West. Professors of law at the time had a major play a major part in the blind copying of the solutions they knew from the books only. There was not law in action, but precisely only, only law in books. It's a clinical illustration of the old legal realist distinction between law in books and law in action. At present, we have a completely different generation of the intelligentsia in the Central Eastern Europe. <coughs> one aware of its rights and identity, a generation of people who are at least critical of the constitutional transplants imported carelessly from the West. Even more, the new generation of intelligentsia sees clearly the connection between transplanted institution and the economic interests of some social groups. Faith in the distributive principle of market forces, neutrality and impartiality of law is criticized from both the political, political right as well as from the political left. The current generation of citizens are interested in their own societies, historically rich constitutional identities. It must be added that in the Central Eastern European countries, there is a deep split between the intelligentsia from the big cities and the new generation of intelligentsia from the middle towns and the smaller towns. The present conflict around the constitution and the rise of constitutional populism in the, in the region states is the, uh, states is the outcome of a deep political split within the intelligentsia in these countries. At the moment, the part of the intelligentsia that is less individualistic and more attached to the local tradition and identities has won the battle for the hearts and minds of citizens, at least for, the, for a while only. The outcome is a crisis of uh, liberal constitutionalism. And the third one, it means that from the purely structural point of view, the cause of the rise of populism in the region is, has something to do with, uh, with the socio-economical trends. It means trends which are here and also uh, global trends. Liberal policies implemented after 1989 have come to an end. Development based on consumption and reservoir of cheap labor does not offer any further prospects. Economic and social exclusion of a large proportion of societies and the need to implement social policies which restore social citizenship as a prerequisite for democracy have become not only more visible but also obvious for the whole spectrum of the po po political spectrum. Liberal interpretations do not take these three elements into account in a satisfactory way. The dominant approach is the use of the concept of populism, which I will discuss a bit later. So it means, <coughs> what are the most important issues that so they're articulated by the populists in power? And I, I identify three such issues, it seems to me, around each all those discuss discussion is going on. So the first one is a democracy understood as a realization of the will of the people, not restrained by formal institutional obstacles of liberal institutional democracy. The second is an identity broadly understood, a cultural identity of the people and also institutional identity, including constitutional identity. And the third one is a question of equality understood as economic policies which should eliminate social and political exclusion of some parts of the people. And uh, what I try to, to show here is basically the causes it means which, which uh, push or provide a fuel, push forward this explosion or the rise of the populace in this, in this part, it means in the, some countries of Central Eastern Europe. But now the, 
liberal constitutionalism, it seems to me, could be interpreted as a source of populism here, right? It means liberal constitutionalism is criticized for imposing through its institutional system restrictions of on, on democracy. The sovereign people are excluded from democratic processes due to the formal legalistic operation of constitutional institutions, such as constitutional courts and tribunals, and the system of justice generally, uh, <coughs> it means uh, system of, of justice and uh, to which the access to this system is limited, right? Due to the some economical, uh, economical um, variables. If we reconstruct model of reasoning, it means of the legal constitutionalism, it is a legal institutional restriction characteristic to liberal constitutionalism. That, co that means so the aim of that is to restrain power. But the power is perceived in a very narrow way and reduced basically only to political power, not to the non means private powers which exist and play other, such as economical powers which uh, plays an important no, no, role. And, uh, but what is more important, it seems to me, that in this, this liberal, constitu liberal democratic constitutionalists in some countries of the Central Eastern Europe, they slide to the pure legalistic or legal constitutionalism in which the crucial, I want to stress, crucial political decisions are taken not by the parliaments, representatives of the people, but the group of the not elected by anybody judges only. Either they say question of the abortion, not abortion, marriages, not marriage, the same couple marriage, and so on, so on. Which that's something which is shows that this legal uh, constitutionalism is a, is sort of the impose some restraint on uh, democratic processes. And uh, <coughs> So the legal, legal constitutionalism imposes restriction on political constitutionalism. The latter is perceived as a democratic and the former as an as a elitist and anti-democratic. All the more because in contemporary liberal constitutional systems, policies adopted by the judiciary and indeed often the executive power usually are adopted not by the simple articulation by representatives, in the legislature, but are created by the group of experts and then translated into legal language by another group of experts. This is presented by populists as a restriction imposed by the elites on the will of sovereign, that is the, the will of the majority. And more than 33 years after the political transformation, the following achievement on relative economic stability, citizens in the region wake up and voted to have a more real impact on uh, public life. And then <coughs> is a question of uh, identity. What is quite, it seems I try to, to speed up now because time is com coming, that, that what is the most important, it means from the point of view of, the, of uh, identity, there are some trends of the cultural modernization, right? If, which means sort of the modernization which is going around the world. And at the same time, it means preservation of the difference of the, all the identity of the, of the ethnic or some other groups. What the populists do, how they address the problem, it means they don't stress individual rights, but they stress the group rights. And that's something which is their vision of the how to change, basically, existing dominant type of the, of the, of the consti constitutionalism. And uh, <coughs> and the last part, it means what is equality, it means what is here. Well, according, I only give you some, some statistic, right? It means in the recent, this <sighs> We don't have to make a reference to Piketty, basically, but it is uh, sort of the repeated uh, of fall to the findings done by the Piketty. And the Piketty wrote his book right, about the distribution of wealth, right? It is quite scary because what he shows that uh, basically distribution of wealth is permanently the same. It means that 10% of the people own 
by own basically 60% uh, of the economical assets. And only one event, is which events, which uh, reduce this growing gap between the rich and, uh, and poor are wars, actually. But what Piketty claimed that after each war, this gap a bit was narrower, which is a, a, a really scary vision that only war actually could reduce. But what I wanted to say is that precisely in the, at the moment, now, when we talk about, it means in Poland, 10% of the people own more than 60% of the economical assets in the, in, in the country. And uh, populists use that in a very effective, effective way. So what I want to, s to, to say as a finishing almost, I'm going to the last part basically, is that when we talk about the constitutionalism, and I mentioned that what is needed is development of the new categories, it means not to reduce only to the legal principle. We have to talk about the social constitutionalism, right, as such. And uh, social constitutionalism, I mean, sometimes it's called societal constitutionalism, is as a stream of ideas, not, not one comprehensive theory, right? And uh, from this, our point, my point of view, it is important to build a juncture between the sociology and the formal legal approach to constitutions. Social constitutionalism is not a normative approach, but rather a combination of social theory, empirical sociological data, and legal material. Social constitutionalists focus on the social role of the constitution and also on the social ontology of constitutional institutions. As to the last one, social constitutionalists reject methodological individualism. It stressed that it is society which, with its structure and social institution that is a foundation of constitutions. The object of interest is the social legitimacy and legal of legal constitutions, constitutional identity and processes which lead to or undermine the legal constitution. Social constitutionalists rightly claim that the classical constitutionalism with its concept of sovereignty of the people, division of power and principle of legalism is the product of so social historical processes. They rightly, it means doesn't possess the universal character, right? They rightly criticize the fact that in the contemporary world, constitutionalism operates with top narrow concept of power, as I mentioned before, limited only to the political power. And the second one, it, it seems to me, what is, what is happening now, as I, I see, is a bigger stress put on the political constitutionalism, right? Which means, was as a sort of the, in the Republican way, which means in such a way to provide a platform or the design of institutions which will give more power or empower in, in bigger way c citizens. And, uh, and having said that, it means that this political constitutionalism is in opposition to the legal constitutionalism. And the legal constitutionalism is not only what I described be before, but I would, I would like to make a reference to the, to again, to, to uh, Wojciech Sadurski, who wrote a book uh, some time ago on uh, constitutional courts in Central Eastern Europe. And the title of this book is Rights Before Courts. What he stressed, he criticized heavily actually in this book, the role of the constitutional judiciary in Central Eastern Europe. And uh, Sadurski rightly noted that the characteristic features of the Central Eastern European constitutional judiciaries are the first, cultural courts of the re region have the right to perform abstract judicial review. That is, they can adjudicate on the constitutionality of legislature, legislative act without the need for a specific case or a controversy to arise, which means is a sort of review in abstracto, right? But review in abstracto immediately give much more power to the, to the, to the, to the constitutional judiciary, to the, to the judges in the constitutional court, than the, the review in concreto. 
which means it starts with a peculiar type of a, of a case, like in the, in the US. Then the second, what Sadurski wrote, is that the dominant model of the coastal review in the region is ex post control. That is control of the constitutionality of already enacted legal acts. These features make the constitutional judiciary of Central Eastern Europe a key player in deciding social conflicts. And this means that when deciding the constitutionality of legislation, the constitutional judiciary is an active political actor. It's not neutral. I mean, we don't talk about the neutrality of the, of the, of the constitutional uh, mm, tribunal or court judges but <coughs> or <coughs> impartiality as such. They are political players, right? And, uh, and they in, in decision-making processes. And I want to also add to you that peculiar features which of a, of a legal tradition, actually, which develop in the former communist countries. It is uh, Alan Uzelas, Croatian law professor. Uh, he wrote a short piece, actually, in which he claimed that when comparative lawyers, they talk about the legal traditions and they distinguish common law tradition, let's say civil law tradition and so on. And Uzelats proposed to add a new tradition, which he called vertical socialist tradition. What is a characteristic feature, according to Uzelats, of this tradition is a total formalism. Right? Formalism, he explained that the formalism in the former communist countries is an escape from responsibility, basically. It means not to really engage with the issue, but put everything on the formal way. So to conclude, <laughs> what I wanted to say is, I am not sure if it was clear, but, but sorry for that. Uh, populism had a profound impact on a constitutionalism in Central Eastern Europe. The changes, uh, the changes are deep and uh, mask institutionally. Somewhere on the horizon, slowly, signs of the new perception of democracy and constitutionalism appear. At the moment, it is too early to describe their new forms, what new inst institutional structures will look like. One thing that is sure, I believe, is that we now see how concepts and institutions in which we grew <laughs> have grown up are slowly changing, or some of them passing into history. We live at a time of a collapse of constitutional imaginaries. I do not claim that this is good, but, I cannot be, uh, but it cannot be ignored. Slow death is also the birth of something new. One lesson that might be drawn by social scientists is that, is that too great an attachment to noun forms is dangerous and could kill the essence of constitutionalism, constitutionalism itself. So that's, that's my sort of the overview from my perspective of the relationship between the constitutionalism and populism in some Central Eastern European countries. Thank you very much. be quite interesting if, uh, if <laughs> thank you uh, thank you for your presentation dr. Sarnota uh, uh, I would like to ask, ask a question about uh, historical perspective uh, if we know the modern constitu constitutionalism is based and shifted for centuries it takes roots from uh, uh, English Revolution then uh, reversion um, independence war in America and then the French Revolution, and it was shaped in centuries and had a long way to come to this day. But um, due to the Soviet period, uh, Eastern countries and Central European countries, they, all the development of uh, constitutional rights have been turned down and have this gap of 60 years, even more. And uh, the whole Europe and the Western world have contingency, but our region lacks that 
Maybe this is the reason or what we can do about this. Thank you. Could you please repeat the last part because I didn't pick up. Yeah. yeah. So my, my point was uh, the uh, Western tradition of constitutionalism mm -hmm. has developed and has the continuously. But our region, uh, the Eastern, Eastern Europe and Central Europe, is uh, a victim of the Soviet period and they lost this, those roots and connection to the rest of the constitutional world. So how we can escape this or work it out from your perspective? Okay. Mm. Should I answer now or let's pick up the one? Answer now, right? Exactly. Thanks very much for the question. That's a not easy question, right? And uh, some I, w I was told actually that, uh, that uh, Joseph Raas, distinguished you know, legal uh, philosopher, right? When he was asked by the people in the region, uh, so what we should do in order, to, in order to get a rule of law? There was silence, and then he said, wait one thousand years and you will get it. But I don't think that is a, is a, is a good answer, actually. It seems to me is a, is that, that we have to do something. The first of all, it means <coughs> I, don't have, I don't have any prescription. I don't have any medicine, what to do. Well, it seems to me I treat some, not all, populist movement in Central Eastern Europe precisely as this shift. It means the tectonic, it means the changing. That the form which was transplanted from the so-called West is, uh, doesn't fit to the social structure here. Therefore, probably in the perspective of next 10, 15, 20 years, we will see the institutional adaptations to the, to the traditions, identity, and the structure of society here, right? I mean, because uh, constitution is not only something which is written, right? It means is a constitution is, must be embodied in the, in the society. On the other hand, well, I wouldn't exaggerate with this so-called West, that the constitutionalists in the West, you know, develop for 100, for, for thousands of years. As you know, the history of England uh, was dramatic, right? And the freedom was uh, much later than, than in the, let's say, Bohemia, or, or Hungary, right? Hungary, with Golden Bulla here. And uh, on the other hand, you know, is, uh, is, is uh, mm, after the Second World War, up to the Second World War, democracy was also very fresh there, right? It means, if you look at Britain, right, that the democracy basically was, was introduced in the Second Parliament, par Parliamentary Reform from 1863, before majority of people, working class, didn't have a right to vote, right? If you look at the history of, cultural history of France, then we find out that was a division between the so-called active and passive cit citizens. Only active citizens had a right to vote if they pay some amount of taxes, right? All others were excluded from this. And somehow it worked at the moment. So I am, I am, from such point of view, I am optimistic that we in the Central Eastern Europe, we've got our own constitutional tradition. And I'm, let's say, uh, look at this golden bulla, for instance, right? Which is a, the document on the probably much bigger scale than the, than, the <coughs> than the Magna Carta Libertatum from 1215, which was forgotten and then taken up in the 16th century in the conflict with the, with the, with the, with the, with the king, right? And uh, so I don't have a precisely any suggestion what sh we supposed to do, but what I knew is that uh, precisely legal academics here in this part of the world, they should not only be uh, influenced by the colleagues in the West, but they should simply work independently. It means to look at the, what is on the ground here and uh, show their own imaginary, as uh, Egypt Shiban recently is, is defending this concept of the, of the constitutional imaginaries, right? But they're not imaginaries taken and borrowed again from, by someone, but precisely the ma imaginaries which are outcome of the experiences here and now in this part of the world. So, sorry, but I don't have a precise answer what to do and how long it will take. Yeah. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much for the, uh, your lecture. I'm Jan Spried, I'm professor of economics. So obviously, I'm trying to capture things that are interesting to me. And the most interesting thing to me, obviously, was the part you talked about the distribution of the wealth, mm -hmm. the 10% controlling you know, more than 60%. And you had a reference to the Poland. And obviously, in the context of populism, could you please explain this to me, that you're saying that this is relatively constant for a longer period of time. And populists usually are addressing, you know, majority of the people with interesting ideas and obviously kind of looking again at the risk distribution of the wealth in the world. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can comment on the example of Poland or, or other European yeah. countries. Why populists, they don't succeed? Why this, like, you know, redistribution of the wealth is actually constant for a long period of time? Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Very, very good question, it seems to me. So my under I will try to explain how to combine that this uh, problem of the social inequalities, how the populists take up the issue and try to redistribute, right? And uh, probably the easiest way, you know, taking the kind of example of Poland, is a division between the center and periphery, right? So since introduction of the Balcerowicz plan, right, the Balcerowicz plan was not only about, you know, this <coughs> killing inflation and so on, but also was connected with the with the enormous economical uh, centralization in such a way that the businesses were located only in the big cities. And then the, the, the liberals at, you know, in power, they try to follow that and they even build a plan that actually would be concentration of the mega cities. Outcome of that was that people in the so-called provinces, right, peripheries, they were simply neglected, neglected in the excluded excluded from the communication because of the, you know, closing of railway, for instance, and the elimination of the buses because they were not anymore economically, um, economically feasible, right? And um, so that the crumbling down of infrastructure. And that now it's what's happened in 2015 was, and even the people who criticize the uh, Law and Justice Party, right, they are giving credit to them that uh, due to the economical or social policies actually, the first of all, they stream distribution from the budget to the, to the provinces, right? And, uh, and the second, it means those socially excluded, so-called 500 plus, you know, that money for the kids, right? And, uh, and so on, that, uh, <coughs> that this discrepancy between the poor uh, not, not discrepancy between the poor, but rather that a lot of people were taken out of the poverty and uh, put above the level of poverty. Of course, uh, they are not angels, and it's obvious that they do for the political reason, right? It means political reason that, uh, that to have a voter. It means people will vote for them. But what is, what is easily visible, actually, is that in the small towns, let's say, somewhere in the so-called Polish B, or it means on the Easter flank, right? Like, let's say, yeah, Białystok going up, down to the, to the border with, with Ukraine and, and, and uh, <coughs> Slovakia, that, that was enormous change in these uh, five years, right? Since they are in, oh, seven years, since they are in power. It's transferred. So in such, uh, such sense that populist, Probably in Italy, right, if we look at the, at the <coughs> Cinque Stella and uh, other populist movement, they, not all of them are interested in the change of the distribution of wealth. It means if you look at the North, right, this North will be interested in keeping money actually in the North, not transferring to, to the South. And, uh, but some other movements, more, let's say, leftist oriented, uh, so I'm so, uh, interested in the redistribution. Historically, populists always, if you look at Peronism, for instance, right, was sort of the building up, what, development of the social policies in Argentina, right, for the long time, which ruined economy in the end, right? but, but, uh, but it works for the, for the short time, but maybe even not for the short time, for the longer time, because it built up this uh, ethos of Peron and, uh, and uh, Evita and so on, so on, right? and the attachment to the, some social programs which, which the Peron's regime uh, implemented. Right? So I'm 
it's not a qu question that they want to make an equality, not at all. But uh, it's true, it seems to me, that by, by the elimination of a, a radical elimination of the poverty and then redistribution, regional redistribution of the of a, um, direction of spending, then this social citizenship as such, which is the base for the new constitutionalists, increase, right? Hello, uh, my name is Alex Austas. I'm also a teacher here in the school, teaching political economics, migration, and new governance uh, courses. Uh, what I hear from you is pretty cons uh, disturbing because what you suggest is that we sort of have rights have um, uh, particularism of Central Eastern European constitutionalism, which is uh, what I'm, I'm trying to guess what sort of constitutionalism would, would it be? Because to my understanding, uh, the liberal tradition of Western European constitutionalism is about constraining the power by prioritizing the individual rights of, of human uh, peop uh, people, like dignity, etc., so that uh, to uh, protect people from from um, from power or from uh, from um, the so-called tyranny of, of majority. If you said that we deserve other routes, then what would it be? And I see here that our route would be then more violence, uh, probably restoration of, of uh, capital punishment, restrictions on certain uh, group rights, etc., etc. So the uh, communal conflicts will become more violent under such Eastern European constitutionalism by giving away uh, this liberal tradition. What, uh, what I prefer not empirically to, to, to verify or falsify <laughs> your statement. Uh, uh, but uh, first of all, it seems to me uh, I don't think personally that uh, everything what the populist parties in power do is good. That's not my idea, right? I mean, I did, I did focus today on the necessity of changes in the constitutionalism which exists now. And I, I try to show the shortcomings of the liberal democratic constitutionalism. But that, that, uh, <coughs> having said that, it means I don't, it seems to me it would be possible to find a balance between the individual rights and the group rights, for instance. Canada is a good example of that, right? With, uh, on the one hand, is a liberal constitutional democracy. On the other hand, it recognizes the group rights of the uh, French-speaking Canadians versus the Anglophones, or the, let's say the mm, uh, mm, prime nation, nations people right there. So I mean, this balance, it seems to me, is, uh, is, is possible to find. Um, what I criticize is excessive individualism, which means that we arrive, cons we in the, in the West uh, arrive to the position where actually always individual rights in interest was dominant and, uh, and, uh, and, bef and far before the solidarity and the group rights, right, with others. When this balance is being somehow lost totally. Now the next question is, how institutionally solve the problem. It means how to design the institutions. And, uh, and it seems to me that what is necessary is, uh, the first of all, uh, judiciary, because now we talk about the judiciary, must become accountable. Accountable, and uh, in, my, in my opinion, it means the biggest, one of the biggest problems which we face now in Central Eastern Europe is uh, account not accountability of judiciary. They are simply <coughs> responsible before God and history only. And why not? It means in the US, at least in the some states, they elect judges and they could revoke from the uh, ju judge from the, from the position. It works, it works. I don't want to sa say, let's copy this solution. But it seems to me that we have to think what to do, actually, to simply find this balance between individual and the group rights. So I am not that pessimistic that the changes will finish in violence, right? Uh, <coughs> on the other hand, you know that there was a graffiti in 68. I'm old guy, so I, I don't remember the, <laughs> the graffiti in 68, but I remember reading about this graffiti that one of the graffiti in Paris was 
a little bit of violence never harm anybody, but a little bit of violence. I'm not sure. I don't share this opinion. I am just repeating what, 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 how this expression. Uh, but finishing, it seems to me, tell me, Inis, is this good or is this right that crucial existential decisions are taken by the, let's say, group of seven, ten, twelve judges? No, but precisely, it seems to me, personally, I, uh, I think, from the normative, my normative point of view, that I am grown enough, right, and my compatriots are also responsible, reasonable citizens as such, that we don't need somebody, some Europak of the chosen, let's say, to take decision on my behalf in relation to life and death, for instance, right, that I'm for this is a democratic mechanism of uh, choosing <coughs> representatives and uh, they simply should take decision and they are accountable at least maybe not fully but much more than the group of of judges only My name is Alexander Spivers. Uh, I'm also teaching yeah, no, you. I remember. You know, obviously, <laughs> I make it for, uh, if it's needed for the broad audience. Uh, I understood from what you said, I mean, I, I kind of consider that I believe that what, from what you said that you were kind of skeptical overall over this transplantation of the legal traditions from one country to, to, to another, from the Western countries. But uh, on the other hand, we see that there is some backlash, at, at least in some countries, in Central Europe. But however, but maybe overall it's the right strategy in a sense that uh, there was this transplantation. There was obviously some effect of that. Probably there were some people born in that regime where the Western European constitution. Now there might be some backlash as I don't know, we can come up, come back to like French Revolution. There was restoration then again. And this will be something like that, where there will be a certain, re not restoration, but some new situation under the populist rule. And then it will come back again. And in the end, it's just a kind of movement towards these Western democracies with some problems in the midst of that. But that this is just a natural way how it can be implemented. So there's a generation that has born and has lived in these democratic values. And in the mm -hmm. end of the day, it will have, again, certain same future. Wouldn't that be kind of the result of it rather than the new constitutional tradition? Uh, I didn't say about the new constitutional tradition, but some sort of modified constitutional tradition, uh, which is not the new. Uh, but my answer would be probably fast. Look at Iraq. Implementation, transplantation of institution. What is the outcome? None, basically. It means bigger house than before. So is there is it's for sure you know that uh, Alan Watson wrote about this legal transplants, right? But he also he, he coined this expression, legal, legal transplant. But he also mentioned that legal transplant, transplant never ever work in the way they used to work in the original context, right? So therefore it seems to me that if we think about the rule of law, for instance here, and it's not a legal transplant, it's a transplant of the same idea. But the interpretation of this idea could be different. What is the one dominant type of interpretation? Stick to the legal text. As you know, text never spoke for, for itself. Text require interpretation, and so on, so on. So therefore, it means uh, it, legal transplant, more important than institutions, is the context of operation of this institution, right? So I am. Uh, I, I would probably agree with you in with such way that let's give a chance to the transplants. They will be under the process of mutation, right? So let's say generation two, three, four after the trans transplantation itself, 
they even won't remind the original, <laughs> original of, of transplantation. And that's what is happening, it seems to me, what I try to def defend, that the, what are the movements, processes, which, which push for the change, right? But then, again, it is a, I am really, first of all, I don't, I don't like, really, uh, what I don't like in the Central Eastern Europe is a sort of the, uh, how to say, subservient attitudes towards the colleagues in the West. That we look at them as a, you know, bright and blah, blah, blah. It's no, it's, it's, we should be proud of ourselves. You are, we are <coughs> not, no more stupid, no more, you know, wise. We are simply the same almost. And we've got our own experiences, which we should be proud of. And which we're supposed to share that experiences. So therefore, it seems to me, is a, is a look at the, what is here, not through their glasses, lenses, but through our glasses, lenses, right? And, and try to conceptualize that, try to build up some explanatory theory, te theories. It means we are periphery of, of, uh, of the West. It, not in, it won't change for the long, long time, I believe, right? But at the same time, if you have to remember that the bright ideas always were coming from where? Not from the centers, but from the peripheries, right? Gandhi was not from London. Gandhi was from India. India was a, was a colony of, of Britain at the time. But Ahinsa, which he developed the idea, right, was where from? Precisely from the periphery. And then I could make a plenty of different type of the examples the same. What is more difficult, it seems to me, is to find out the legal <laughs> institutional examples. Be but why? That's a question how to explain that it is, that is difficult. But that is for the, another type of lecture, which I probably won't deliver, because after this one, they won't sign the contract with me. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Um, presentation, and uh, you know, I could, in a way, I could follow up on 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 on, on Dr. Auster's question and uh, ask, well, you know, if 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 you say that you know this import of certain constitutional frameworks uh, doesn't work, uh, you know, what would have worked in Central Europe? But if 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 you don't like that question, I have a slightly different and more <laughs> sort of political science type of question. Okay, if uh, you said that, uh, you know, this, this spread of populism is partially a function of, you know, certain constitutional uh, mechanisms that were imported and so on and so forth. Okay, if we accept this, then how would you uh, explain the spread of populism in Italy or even more so in the United States where you can't really claim that this is something imported? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, thanks very much for the question. As I tried to say during my talk, probably didn't sound enough loudly, that uh, the sources of the populism are different in the different, different countries. So what, I, what populism as such, right, is not an ideology. It means it is a rather, one of my friends coined this expression, is a chameleon type of ideology, which means it always fits on the, some other ideology, right? It means it's taking issues from this ideology and transforming it. So in Italy, I don't think that the, the biggest issue is a functioning, let's say, of the judicial system, but some other issues uh, play the more important role. What is here, it seems to me, if we look from the, from the at populism, that there's no, uh, no, it seems to me, accident that the Law and Justice Party has a justice and law in its name. 
And it's not an accident that this party was uh, built up when the president, the oh, minister for justice, was the late, late uh, uh, brother of, uh, of uh, Kaczynski, right? Why? Because precisely of the dissatisfaction which was proved by the, by the sociological polls with uh, access to justice, right? And then if you look at the, at the first attempt of reform after 2015, which means reform or uh, some of my, <laughs> my colleagues will say dismantling, right? Is a, so the direction, the main direction was precisely in what? Constitutional tribunal, right? Which doesn't function basically. If they, oh, it's, it's functioning, but it doesn't have any legitimacy anymore. And then to the Supreme Court and the uh, reform the judicial systems. So what I try to say that because of the prevalence of in Poland of that uh, legal constitutionalism, which imposed some corset on the activity of people, Kaczynski, uh, Kaczynski, uh, the leader of the Law and Justice Party, coined this expression legal impossibilism, which means that the people claim something before the court, then the court became so formalistic that it was impossible to do, we uh, cope with the, with the case. That's the case of the privatization, let's say, issues and so on and so on. And that's why I claim that the, that the sources, uh, the source of a populism in Poland, in Hungary as well, that's why I'm most familiar with, is precisely dissatisfaction with the peculiar type of the operation of a, of a legal and judicial, judicial system. When in Italy, or let's say in, in, in Brazil, or let's say in the Filipino, right, it was that the, the sources are different, and that, which means their version of populism fits on the different type of issues than, than here. Yeah. Oh, I had to shut up. Thank you. I'm, thank you very much for, the, for the, your patience and listening to me. I really apologize because I wanted to pack. I, it was a mistake. I packed too much, actually, so I should simply skip a half of the issues and present in a mo more simple way. But um, hopefully I will meet you somewhere here and if you have a questions then don't hesitate to, to ask me. Thank you very much.